guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 164, featuring a brand new retrospect. Now, as you know, instead of selecting these games myself, I select them randomly from the selections that you guys send in. Now, this week's winner is Jack Day with a very interesting game submission. So tell me, Jack, what game would you like to see on the show? Hi, Matt. Uh, I've managed to get my headset working, as you can see. Um, I was wondering if you could possibly do a retrospective on the Tone Rebellion. It's an RTS game, rather obscure little title, uh, that came out round about 1998, circa that time. Uh, it's rather interesting, due to the fact that it can, um, you basically control a series of floating islands, and on those floating islands, you uh, battle against this thing known as Leviathan. And uh, there haven't been many videos on the internet, unfortunately. But it would be quite interesting if we did do a retrospective, seeing as it's one of the more overlooked uh, gems of what I would call the late 19 era. Thank you. All right, here we go with a little game called the Tone Rebellion. This is a 1997 game from Jason and Todd Templeman. They had a company called The Logic Factory back in the 90s. They, before this, had a, a game called Ascendancy. Apparently that game was just so full of uh, bugs it didn't do very well. This game doesn't seem to have uh, really any bugs to speak of. At least I didn't encounter any as I played. It's very playable. I didn't have to do anything special to get this running in Windows 7. So I think that uh, says something about, you know, something uh, for it. Uh, the gameplay here is uh, fairly abstract. Instead of orcs and humans or something like that, we've got these floaters. These little critters you see carrying these, uh, I heard them described in one YouTube video as blue cotton balls. Those are actually the structural elements you need. But basically, uh, in this game, all of the resources emanate from something called tone, which to me seems like some kind of liquid. You see it there in that pool bubbling up. So you put, you start to build around the pools, you get this uh, flow coming in, and then you can build structures that take part of the flow to create the cotton balls for your structures, where there's little crystals that you need for your soldier floaters, and then later on you'll even need a, a third kind called magic, that you create these magicians, uh, wizard-like floaters that have really interesting uh, sets of spells. There are four different kinds of floaters that you can play. There's the uh, Tark, Zygon, Cephians, and D Dyla. And they all have uh, different abilities, different kinds of structures. Uh, quite a bit of variety, so there's definitely a, a high replay value here. Especially if you're doing uh, the multiplayer. I'll just be showing you the single player in this video. One of the things I liked about this game is the layout. As you can see there in the lower middle portion of the screen is a map. I've only got the left hand side of it filled out for now, but if I get to the edge and put down a special kind of structure, um, uh, this little guy right here, a tone spreader, it will expand uh, the map a little bit, get rid of the fog of war. It's a little bit uh, irritating perhaps because the enemies can be in that black part and still attack you, although you can't always attack them back, so it's really imperative to get these tone spreaders built as soon as possible. Now, another really cool thing are these artifacts that you find. It's almost a, an adventure game-like aspect of this game. You have to collect the various artifacts, uh, read the descriptions, and then figure out where to apply them, where to use them. It's uh, it, they, You might have to use them on a part of on a world that you haven't even been to yet, a different island. A lot of this game seems to be steeped in pretty weird mysticism. Uh, the artifacts when you do get them assembled uh, you get these uh, words of wisdom the sort of scriptural runes that pop up it's all very ethereal and you're probably enjoying the music that's probably my favorite aspect of the game actually is this wonderful soundtrack uh, the package I downloaded actually had has the soundtrack as mp3 files I'm very excited about that okay there is my uh, soldier building now that's going to have to have uh, these uh, blue sort of purple crystals before they'll, they'll start outputting soldiers. So I need to get some of the crystal builder structures built. There's a lot of uh, emphasis in this game on the 
let's see, what was it called? The baggage train or the supply line. Yeah, the supply line. Uh, meaning that if you have too much stuff going on at once, your uh, workers will be overwhelmed and stuff will start getting built really, really slowly. Uh, the soldiers will not get the resources they need until it's too late. So it's, it, there's a lot of uh, timing with this. I don't know if that's obvious just from watching me play. But you have to constantly make decisions about where you want to put your priorities, uh, where you want to expand to. Thankfully, once you get one of these worlds clear, I never had a problem with the uh, Leviathan coming into, you know, into a world from another world. Like I said, I haven't finished the game, so that might happen later on. But at least uh, as far as I played, once you get one of the worlds clear, uh, you're free to focus on the next world in the chain. Of course, I am playing on the easiest level. Can't imagine what the hardest level must be like. I mean, this was plenty challenging enough for me. So look at all these floaters go. You know, one thing I love about these uh, real-time strategy games is it's just so neat to sit back occasionally and just look at look at all the stuff you've got going on. It's a lot to see, a lot of eye candy. Okay, got my another tone spreader built. You can see I'm now able to reach over here. Uh, there's one of the Leviathan's spawner, spawning buildings. I want to get that destroyed as, as quickly as possible. When you attack, all you have to do is uh, select one of your units there on the left and right-click on what you want to attack. There's a little bit of AI. You can have them uh, guard a spot or attack an area. But I found uh, the AI wasn't really all that great, so, you know, expect to do some micromanaging here. One of the more interesting aspects of the AI is if you're monsters, uh, I mean your floaters get damaged enough or they run out of charge or whatever it is they use to attack with. Uh, they'll actually leave, go back to base and come back. So they might leave a position vulnerable doing that. So it kind of pays uh, instead of building all of your soldier construction buildings all in the same area, it actually makes more sense to build them by the uh, the bridges or or spread them out amongst the worlds so they don't have to go so far uh, back to their home base. And you do have to remember where you put them. <laughs> you know, it's a, a little bit of memory here. But I like it. You know, there, it's uh, very strategic thinking. Now, unfortunately, this game is obscure as all get out. It took me quite a while to find it, and I never was able to find a manual for it. was able to find a strategy guide, though, that gave some much needed information if you really want to play this seriously. One is you can't uh, create workers manually. Uh, what you have to do is uh, have a surplus of five tone or greater and then just automatically spawn. And also you can uh, teleport buildings uh, closer to the front lines or wherever you need them, but you're going to need a supply of magic and uh, structural components to do that. And, you know, plus there's a lot of stuff you can do with the sorcerers once you get them. Now, there is an RPG element in that your floaters will level up as uh, they gain experience. Uh, but also, as you go into uh, different islands and explore more, uh, you'll be able to upgrade your buildings. And that also upgrades them, in addition to uh, giving you new types of uh, structures you can build. So there's a lot. Uh, you have to do a lot <laughs> in this game to... Uh, you know, gain access to the cooler stuff. Anyway, the, the positive side of that is, of course, it encourages you to explore, and it links that directly to the unit advancement. I think that's a really nice uh, way to do it, actually. You might have noticed that I've occasionally uh, sped up. That's actually in the game. It's a pretty cool feature if you hit Control-9, I believe. That'll speed it up. And then you just hit Control-8 uh, to wind it back down. You can also hit Control 4, or maybe it's 5, somewhere in there, and that will let you play on a window. That's actually good to know because I had some uh, color problems when I tried to play it uh, full screen, but for whatever reason, when I went to the windowed version, uh, that went away. So what you're looking at here basically is an expanded version of that windowed version. So expect a little bit of sharper graphics if you play this uh, on your machine. All right, let's uh, skip forward a bit and see what the later stages of the game look like. All right, so it's a little bit later in the game. I've uncovered a few more islands. And uh, by the way, I love that island screen. That is just totally badass. It really makes you want to explore uh, the game. 
Now, when you discover a new world, typically you'll find a bunch of Leviathan there already. So you want to line up your troops, have them go in there and attack, clear it out a little bit, and then you can start sending in the workers to build some tone spreaders and establish your base. It can actually get uh, difficult even on the easy level, especially when there's powerful enemies off to the screen and you can't get to them. As you can see there, I've got some ranged attackers. I've got my frontline units going in, so I should be able to make short work of these foes. You also notice that thing that looks like a crawfish hole there at the top of that pillar is uh, where I need to put my bridge token or bridge pin, whatever they call that thing. That will allow me to access another island. You know, the funny thing about this game is when I was I was watching some other YouTube videos of it and looking at screenshots and everything, it, it didn't really I, di I didn't grasp the appeal of it. But as soon as I started to actually play it. It, it quickly got addictive, and I ended up spending, uh, <laughs> you know, hours and hours and hours playing this thing. And uh, just even after all those hours, I felt like I was just starting to grasp uh, the complexity of this thing. I mean, there's so much to this game that I uh, didn't get to. I know it's there, you know, especially regarding all the sorcerer spells and everything. So it's a very rich game. Uh, there's plenty to do, plenty to learn. Uh, fortunately, they don't throw everything at you at once, you know, thankfully. Uh, so you could pick this up piecemeal. I only wish uh, it would have been really nice to have a little bit more in-game help and documentation, especially considering how rare it is nowadays. Be, I mean, it would be great. I would love, love to see this on GOG uh, with a proper release with the uh, PDF manuals and everything. That would be <laughs> completely awesome. I'm uh, trying to get some friends of mine that have this game to scan the manuals and make them available. It's really difficult to play without it, even if you do have the uh, strategy guide, because I feel like I'm missing out on the story uh, that way. The guys that did the game, Jason and Todd Templeman, uh, they're actually, well, they've actually re-released their earlier game, uh, Ascendancy. They got that out on iPods and iPhones and everything, so... Hopefully, they will turn their attention next to the Tone Rebellion. A lot of the reviews, uh, contemporary reviews I read of the game, uh, of this game, were very positive. You know, everybody liked it that heard of it. Unfortunately, it just uh, seemed very obscure. Apparently, they had some kind of falling out with their publisher at the last minute. And, um, I'm sensing that the obscurity of this game has a lot more to do with politics uh, than it does with the actual quality of the game. So I highly recommend this. I, I really would love to encounter a copy of this anywhere. All right, so let's have a look at one of my other games uh, with a different type of floater uh, so you can compare. So here I am in my Cephian game. This was the uh, first game I launched. I really got into these guys. You can see I've got a lot more islands uh, uncovered with them. Believe it or not, the... Even though there's only four tribes, when I went to the other tribe, it really felt like a whole different aesthetic. You know, a lot of it has to do with colors, I guess, and palettes, but you really feel uh, it's a different mood, a different vibe when you shift to a different tribe, which I, I like very much. Also really love the difference in the, in the islands. A lot of games, uh, you go to a different area, and it's uh, basically the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> There's certain games that the whole freaking world is just a snow-covered wasteland. Uh, this is not the case here at all. As you can see, uh, these different islands really look different. Uh, they feel different and they play different, uh, which I really enjoy. Uh, they all, all have their own uh, artifact puzzles too, which is nice. So again, you know, a lot of uh, reason to explore the worlds and map them out fully. All right, so I've got quite a few projects going on. You know, of course, uh, as you would expect, I'm able to uh, tell the workers to emphasize certain projects, uh, prioritize them, or I can even make them exclusive. Now, there's a, a blue floating guy <laughs> you know, uh, on the uh, one of those maps. I don't know what he, the hell he's doing. But as I was uh, reading the uh, some of the material for this game, it, you know, it said uh, specifically that uh, to these tribes, the behavior of the other tribes is totally mysterious to them. Uh, so it only makes sense that it wouldn't make sense to the player. So we get a nice, uh, a nice uh, science fiction element uh, that I really admire. 
So just to wrap up, I thought I would come back to this game and show you what happens when you uh, get enough artifacts uh, to gain one of these runes of wisdom. So you can see there are artifacts that are randomly distributed. Sometimes I played a game and there might be four artifacts right there on the starting screen, <laughs> which is kind of nice. Uh, in my other games, though, I had to uh, go far and wide to find these. Uh, you never really know where they're going to pop up. Uh, there's one that I've already installed. Okay, so I've got... When you retrieve the artifact, uh, then you have to figure out where it goes. It's usually pretty obvious if you read the description. If you don't have any idea what the hell they're talking about, just be patient. You'll probably see uh, later on. Like, uh, I found something about hands. Uh, so these things look like hands. So I put the artifacts in place, and let's see what happens. Uh, there goes the worker with the artifact. Very exciting. Let's see what happens here. Wow. <laughs> oh, it looks like the face on Mars. So there you have it, folks. Leviathan, Tone Rebellion. Thanks a lot, Jack, for pointing this out. And hopefully I'll be able to have the developers on future Matt Chat. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with the first part of a brand new interview series with Mr. Sandy Peterson. Now, if you don't know who that is, you should. He's worked on some of the best games, tabletop and computer games of all time. It's a really exciting interview. He did a great job. I know you're going to love it, so stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated and or supported the show in any way, including telling your friends about it on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, whatever it is you use. I appreciate it. All right, guys, what about that Ale of the Week? All right, this week I've got a little selection called Red Hoptober Ale. This is from the new Belgium company, and it's their, their fall seasonal. It's a fairly well-known company. You've probably heard of them. Uh, they're out of uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, so let's get the uh, Red Hoptober open and see if it's worth drinking. Okay, so I have the Red Hoptober here in the old drinking horn. I've been smelling this, and I'm, I'm really... Uh, I think I know why they're calling this Hoptober. I can smell the hops already. You can almost smell how bitter this is going to be. Uh, but let's give it a taste. Oh, yes, just as I imagined, it's quite bitter. Uh, that kind of over overwhelms the taste uh, buds, actually. Uh, kind of uh, pleasant, though. It's not unpleasantly bitter. A very strong alcohol taste in this, which I wasn't expecting, considering it only has a 6% alcohol. Still uh, tastes quite strong. Uh, not the most pleasant ale I've ever had. I'm going to uh, give this one maybe a 2 out of 5 drinking horns. Uh, drinkable, uh, but I think there's a lot finer selections out there, so I would keep looking unless you really like a lot of hops, a lot of bitterness. All right, guys, uh, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And the uh, quotation comes from Frank Herbert. It goes something like this. The beginning of knowledge is the discovery of something we do not understand. See you guys next week. You mean that little gadget can do all that? Come on. A gadget? J Jason, please. More than a gadget. A true mini robot. You. I know him. I know him. His serial number is W1K1. W1K1. That looks like Wiki. And it talks, too.